the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. I guess a year and a half ago, it's aired for a couple of years now. So we're going to show a couple of segments from that documentary. And then Mark is going to perform a few corridos. So it's going to be very, very festive. Um, the, the, I just want to say the main reason that it was always so important to me that someone, and I didn't expect it to be me, uh, produce a documentary. I'm a producer, but I don't do documentaries. I do things where I can make money. But this... <laughs> This documentary was very important, not only um, uh, because Dad deserved it for his career and his, his, his life uh, you know, as, a, as a person of, uh, of some stature in our community, like many here, but also that his story um, was Chicano history. It, was, it is Chicano history, his life and career. So it was very important. As you know, nobody knows very much about us yet. And, uh, and through the documentary, you will see, yes, it is his life, it is his career, but it is Chicano history. That was the most important thing for me as well. Um, uh, again, my brother and I want to thank you so much for including uh, Dad today, today, being honored along with the distinguished professor, because we all know very well legacies, no matter how great, uh, do not stay alive by themselves. And so it takes documentaries, it takes the written word, it takes uh, conferences like this to keep those legacies and our history alive. So thank you again for doing this wonderful uh, um, conference. Um, I think we're ready. Where's our magic guy? Hello. Um, I think, oh, did you get to Wee Wee? Did you wash your hands? All right. Um, uh, are we going to lower the lights? I think we need to do something like that, don't you think? Yeah. I think so. Um, I think we can just hit play, and, 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 which would include, and then it'll give you the menu. Oh, you're all, look at you. Okay, hit it. It's very diverse in all his music. However, corridos, I don't know what we're doing. Are you going to have a stool mark or a chair? What did they do? Okay. Come on up. Chat. Join the group. Um, Corridos punctuated, really, his entire life and his career, going back to doing them about uh, uh, Robert Kennedy and Ruben Salazar. Uh, of course, the Corrido de Delena, which you're going to see in a minute about Caesar and the UFW. Um, and all the way to, really, among the last, um, well, it probably may have been the very last song he wrote, Mark. The Corrido de Boxeo. Yeah, Boxeo. Yeah, yeah. The Rai Cooter um, CD that you saw, the Chavez Ravine, which was 2003 when he was, what, 108? How old was he then? About uh, 80, uh, like 83, 80, 85. 80, 85. He was 85, and, uh, and Rai called him because he thought, I figured if I got Lalo, I can get everybody else. And it worked. And, uh, and Dad, who, of course, would say yes to everything. It was no big thing. He'd go to a backyard barbecue. Yeah. He'd just like to sing Any for job. anyone, huh? Any job he'd Yeah, have. really. And so um, uh, Rye told him that he wanted him to, um, to record Barrio Viejo and also um, Los Chico Chico Suaves. Suaves. And then he asked him if he knew anybody <coughs> in Chavez Ravine. Oh, yeah, I know these two guys. They were boxers, and they were good. Could you write a song? And he wrote El Corrido del Boxeo. You were at the session. Yes, yeah, I was helping out. My, at that point, my dad had some dementia happening, and so he needed a lot of help uh, with cues, and, and he had to, I had to write out the lyrics for him. And uh, it, 
I mean, we barely got it out of him, you know. I mean, he was already suffering from dementia pretty bad. But uh, he did a tremendous job. He did all three songs. That, the, that one you saw, that film, that was uh, the one take he did. He did Chuko Suave's one take, that's it. So that was the point that, you know, here he was recording at 85, still creating, and his first recording, as you saw, of that vocalion was 1930-something. Right. Chris knows better than I do. Where's Chris? Yeah. What year well, was that, Chris? Oh, there you are. Hey. Well, there, did you sign a release? Or did I sign a release? What is that? There was that story but I like to tell about the session. This is just a little aside to show my, the way my dad was. I mean, he was very frail, and uh, he was sitting on a stool, and it was really hard, so we had to put a little pillow on it. And so he was up there, and he slipped, and he fell back off of the stool. I mean, this high, he was 85, frail. He fell backwards onto his back, onto a hard floor in the studio. And thank God he was able to avoid his head being hit on the, on the ground. And everybody was stunned and shocked, all the musicians and Ry Cooter. And he gets up, and then he starts shadow boxing. My dad starts going. <laughs> He goes, I'm ready, I'm ready. He goes, are you sure? You're... Oh, yeah, sat down and did his take. I, you know, I couldn't have gotten up. But... And, and Ry Cooter's a, a, a wonderful ego, which we all need to do what we all do. He calls me the next day. He said, oh, my God, I'm glad you were out there. Your father fell right on his back. And, and I could see the headline now. You know, Mexican musician dies at Ry Cooter session. I said, some how records. about Lalo Guerrero killed by record producer? No, his name had to be in the title. You, you heard Dad say there uh, uh, how easy it was for him to write lyrics, and he learned very early on how easy it was for him to rhyme. Among all the things in the collection here um, is the scrapbook that actually our mom, Margaret, kept uh, back in the 30s when he was Los Carlistas. And I'm guessing, uh, yeah, this was late 30s. He did a little drawing. This is a wooden scrapbook with a sawado and everything on it. And he did a little drawing, and already he was writing this. And he's got the name of the, uh, uh, see down there the color picture, that's Los Carlistas, the first group. And he's got Joe Salas, Chole Salas, Goyo Escalante, Lalo Guerrero. Ooh, last build, that's before he learned. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and already he was writing lyrics way back then. And there's mom's name, Margaret Marmion. He, want, he actually was a wonderful artist. If he yeah. didn't know how to yeah. write music, he would have been an artist. Um, do, you want to, uh, do you want to do the Cordelia Delano? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I just want to say that, as everybody said on the documentary, my dad wrote in all genres. He could write whatever and sing whatever. Great, too. Uh, and he did a lot of corridos. Um, he, he did some that he didn't write, and he wrote some as well. He, he recorded a corrido de Cesar Chavez. His granddaughter is here today. And uh, he recorded that, but he did not write that. But he did write a song about Cesar and the farm worker movement called uh, El Corrido de Delano. Uh, what he used to say, Delano, Delano is the way he pronounced it. Because we all know what ano means, right? Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> anus. Of the anus, if you say Delano. So he would say Delano. Um, so anyway, uh, this is one that he wrote for Cesar. And, uh, you know, Cesar, one of the great people of all time, not just last century. You, you will hear a little bit of it by Dad in the next segment, but here's the full. Okay, is this mic on here? The... <clears throat> so this is his Corrido de, de Leno. <clears throat> oh. Año del 65, 66, más o menos Se levantó nuestra gente en los campos de Deleno pidiendo mejores sueldos por trabajar el terreno Estado de California en el condado de Kern se escucharon las palabras ándale paisano ven a ingresar al sindicato nos irá mucho más bien porque salimos en huelga no es para que el mundo se asombre es todo lo si un joven César Chávez es su nombre solo pedimos lo justo y la dignidad del hombre Estado de 
California, en el Valle de San Joaquín Llamó tanto la atención este famoso motín Que vinieron senadores a ver si le hallaban fin Murphy Kennedy vinieron a consultar nuestra gente Escucharon las demandas y se fueron muy conscientes De que se trata de un pueblo trabajador y decente Con el estandarte hermoso de nuestra guadalupana Van marchó a Sacramento, nuestra gente mexicana, a luchar por sus derechos. Dios bendito, a ver si gana. Okay. Welcome to the. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> welcome to the sixth international conference on the Mexican, Chicano, Corrido, or Ballad. I'm Maria Herrera Sobek, I'm sure you, all of you know me, the organizer of this uh, event. And we're supposed to have somebody come in. <laughs> we're waiting for somebody to come in. I don't know what happened to you. Yep. Licencia que el 22 de abril de este año 80 presente algo trágico pasó. Damián García, el amigo que a toda la gente amó, la policía americana a la mala lo mató. En California creció y en el barrio aprendió a llevar la frente en alto. No se nos vaya a olvidar. La ra ra ra, la ra ra, la ra ra, la ra ra. ra. Damián García, UCSB student, my mentor when I became a junior. Allá en San Antonio, a él a la tomó Y allí con toda su gente, su bandera levantó Y en la casa de la raza, Santa Bárbara lo vio A defender al caído y de Asquia la tumba llevó. En California creció y en el barrio aprendió a llevar la frente en alto. No se nos vaya a olvidar. La ra ra ra, la ra ra, la ra ra ra, la ra ra. Adiós Tamián compañero, un humilde servidor, a la gente le recuerda que no te vayan a olvidar. Damián García. Damián García es a student for excellence, UCSB, my mentor, director of Casa de la Raza, then he joined Radical Movement and he was assassinated in LA. This is one of my songs in the album Canciones y Corridos de Aztlán, directed by Dr. Luis Leal. 
Señores, pido licencia para poderles cantar con una botella en la mano, guitarra en la otra, el mojado soy yo. No importa si les quito el tiempo, el pompo es tiempo cuando hay que penar. Dejé yo mi lindo Linares, de trampa me pasé pa' acá, creyendo que acá en este lado hay áreas riquezas y un gran Cadillac. La cosa se ha puesto redura, pues ando vagando de allá y para acá. Trabajo de día y de noche y a pesar de todo no hay para gastar. La pinche migra me trae en su lista, oh madre querida, en donde ando yo. Mi padre me cuenta de los lugares que fue. My father, as an immigrant, went all over the place. And this song is dedicated to my father and my uncle Andres that for over five years they helped this economy to be what it is Trabajo de día y de noche y a pesar de todo no hay para gastar y la migra me trae en su lista oh madre querida en donde ando yo Llegué yo a ser estudiante, a profe casi llegué. En restaurantes lave platos y canté en la calle y barrí también. Por unos asuntos de faldas, al bote caí y a la migra también. Ahora quieren que yo vuelva, que ya mi trabajo no hay que ignorar No importa cómo esté el asunto Yo sé que algún día he de regresar featured singer for this morning was uh, uh, Manuel Unzueta, who is a very, very talented, uh, multifaceted, uh, uh, how would we say it, uh, a man for all seasons uh, type of person, who is a wonderful, also visual artist, and a professor also at uh, Santa, uh, you have taught also at Santa Barbara City College, has taught here at UCSB also, and as you can see also writes corridos and sings corridos, and he has also been involved in the project for the Diaslan uh, Corrido album that I think is being reissued, is that correct? Uh, I want to say a few words about the International Conference. Uh, this is the first time that the International Conference on the Mexican uh, Chicano Corrido is being held here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And we're pleased and honored to host this event this year here on our beautiful campus. Previous Corrido conferences have been held at Monterrey, Mexico, the University of Texas at Austin, and we have one of the directors that did the conference here, Jaime Nicolopoulos, uh, in Mexico City, and Culiacan, uh, Mexico, uh, I believe, also. This, and where? And at UCLA, forgive me. <laughs> this year, we're at our, our sister campus. This year, we're honoring the memory of uh, Professor Guillermo Hernandez, who, who is a professor at UCLA, and the famous and beloved composer singer Lalo Guerrero. Both of these two men are well known for the love of Mexican Chicano music and the contributions they made in this area. 
Professor Hernandez was an expert on the corrido and Lalo Guerrero had a long career as a performer, writer, and singer. We will be hearing tributes for both Professor Hernandez and Mr. Guerrero this morning. I want to thank the co-sponsors of this conference for their generous funding. In particular, I want to thank Professor Carl Gutierrez-Jones, who's the director of the Chicano Studies Institute, and Chris Strackwitz, uh, who's here with us, the president of the Arhuli Foundation. Thank you. Thank you for the generous funds uh, provided. I also want to thank the Office of the Chancellor and the Office of the Executive Vice Chancellor, our EVC, Jean Lucas, who will be saying a few words in a few seconds, and also the Director of the Multicultural Center, the Director of the Latin American Studies Center, uh, the Director of the Office of Equal Opportunity, and Raquel Lopez, uh, the Director of the Casa La Raza, who will also be saying a few words, and uh, the Archie, uh, Archie Green and his uh, Foundation on Labor Studies. I thank Teresa Peña, who has been really working hard all these months trying to make this possible, and the students who have been helping me also. So please allow me to introduce our uh, Executive Vice Chancellor, Jean Lucas, who will also give a few welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be uh, a host for this, uh, this Sixth International Conference. I, I thought uh, first I'd recognize Don Luis uh, Leal, who we just two nights ago celebrated, continued to celebrate his 100th birthday uh, and his contributions uh, to, the, to the field. And uh, we, we had a movie for Don Luis up here. So Don Luis, thank you. As I said the other night, uh, Don Luis has been a scholar uh, longer than I've been on this planet, so uh, it's really a, an honor and a pleasure to have him here this morning. I thought I might take a, since many of you are first comers to UC Santa Barbara, take just a couple of minutes to map out a very brief history uh, of the campus. I'm an engineer by training. Maria's trying to get me to be a humanist, so I thought I'd do a little history here to show that I'm making that transition. Uh, so actually, our history maps back to Finland in 1860 uh, with a, a person by the name of Uno Cygnus. And Uno's uh, contribution to, to education was to come up with the idea that if one combined uh, the use of the hands in woodworking with book learning, uh, there was an advance in the ability of one to, uh, to absorb information. And it was called the Sloyd Method. And the Sloyd Method caught on in Scandinavia and spread throughout Europe. And by the uh, late 1870s uh, and early 1800s, it had shown up here in Santa Barbara uh, in a, an old private school called the Anna S.C. Blake uh, School. Uh, down on State Street in Santa Barbara, was founded in 1881. And the Anna C. Blake School was for women. It taught them home economics, sewing, and Sloyd, uh, as well as, uh, as, as book learning. And the, the Anna uh, Blake School got absorbed by the city of Santa Barbara and then ultimately got absorbed by what was then the, the California Normal School System, which was a teacher's uh, college system in the state of California. Moved up the hill uh, from State Street uh, to close to the El Encanto uh, hotel for those of you that are familiar with the Santa Barbara area, uh, and something we call the Riviera here in, in Santa Barbara, a little bit uh, pompous, but that's what we call it nonetheless. Uh, and sat there as the normal school, the Santa Barbara Normal School for Home Economics and the Manual Arts for a number of, of years. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then in uh, 1941, there was legislation passed and signed by then Governor Earl Warren. Uh, to convert this Santa Barbara Normal School into one of the uh, campuses of the University of California system behind UCLA. Uh, so we were the third campus to become part of the UC system. Uh, and and uh, we opened our doors as the Santa Barbara College of UC in July of 1944. And uh, stayed up there on the Riviera for uh, several years, but it, the, you know, as after the World War II, the baby boom was starting to uh, be felt uh, throughout the educational system in Santa Barbara. And so uh, forward-looking thinkers at that point in time decided that the Riviera was not going to absorb all the students that were going to come through the Santa Barbara campus as part of the UC. Bought a piece of property, uh, which is now the, the site of the Santa Barbara City College, and moved part of its operation there, but rapidly uh, decided that wasn't going to accommodate it either. And so bought the property out here, which at that point in time was a Marine Air Base from World War II. 
the Santa Barbara Airport being the, the part of that Marine Air Base. And if you wander around campus, Maria lets you out at all uh, during the next three days, and you wander around the campus, you'll see nestled amongst the newer buildings some of the old Marine barracks, which are called temporary buildings on our campus, but they've been here longer than anything else. Um, and uh, and we, so we converted uh, very quickly from a sort of a small campus to a rapidly growing campus, especially in the 1960s. Uh, and, uh, and early 70s, and Manuel and I were comparing notes, so we were both students here in the late 60s and early 70s. He was playing at Bersotti's uh, 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 coffee shop, and, uh, and I think I heard many of his songs and just didn't know it at that point in time. He was singing Beatles music, by, by the way, at that point in time. Uh, and, and so uh, we uh, grew slowly uh, from that sort of teacher's college origin uh, over a period of time, and really sort of hit the big time uh, in the mid-1990s. We were elected into the American Association of Universities in 1995. In 1997, there was a study called the Graham Diamond Study, uh, which evaluated uh, uh, both private and public uh, research universities in, the, in America. And we were rated number two of all public uh, research universities in that uh, Graham Diamond Study. Um, and uh, since that time, we've, we've simply uh, uh, gotten better. We've added five Nobel laureates uh, to our uh, faculty over that period of time. Don Luis won the National Medal uh, of Humanities, and we had a, uh, which was a superb and outstanding affair. We had a picture of him the other night with a uh, presidential candidate uh, receiving that National uh, Medal, and also uh, one of our uh, late professors uh, also won the National Medal of Technology in the late 1990s. Um, and, and today we're at 20,000 students. That's the size that we are. We're on the smallish side of a UC campus, we're about 17,000 undergraduates, about 3,000 graduate students. Uh, we have grown in popularity and distinction. We were admitting about 17,000 students for 4,000 slots 14, 15 years ago. Uh, this year we had over 47,000 applications for that same number of slots. Uh, so the average uh, SAT score, GPA, and diversity for the campus has uh, marched steadily up over this last 15 years uh, to the point that we're on the threshold of becoming a Hispanic serving institution and it's one of our goals to actually accomplish that. <laughs> and thank you. And uh, we want to be the first member of the American Association of Universities that's also a Hispanic serving uh, campus and we're far ahead of our competition at this point in time and I think maybe another year or two of successful recruiting and we'll get to that get to that point. And then just a, a peek into the future, uh, we're uh, at the threshold of, of uh, another growth spurt, so we're proposing to grow to 25,000 students by the year 2025 uh, to increase the fraction of graduate versus undergraduate students. Um, but the, uh, the one of the pillars on which we're going to build uh, our, our strength uh, is in diversity because I think we've really demonstrated some best practices in hiring uh, uh, a very diverse faculty, staff, and, and increasing the uh, student body, uh, and also to build on our interdisciplinary uh, background. So we've become a place where people cross disciplinary boundaries very easily, uh, not just in science and engineering, but in the humanities and social sciences as well. All across campus, you'll find very interesting centers and activities and conferences and workshops where people with many different backgrounds come together and share their interests and their methodologies and their expertise in bringing together uh, and generating new knowledge, uh, new information, and new techniques uh, which are of interest to the uh, academic and the world community at large. So we want to welcome you to Santa Barbara. I, looking at the agenda, the only thing I feel bad about is that I'm not able to participate uh, all three days because it looks like a, tr a terrific lineup. I want to thank uh, Maria and her colleagues for, for uh, helping to organize this and, and hope that you enjoy uh, your conference here and your stay in Santa Barbara. So thanks very much. Uh, a lot of people were involved in uh, this event, so we have a lined up of uh, welcoming people or people that are uh, will be discussing uh, uh, issues related uh, to the conference. So our next uh, speaker welcoming that will be welcoming you is Carl Gutierrez Jones, who's the director of the Chicano Studies Institute. Carl. Buenos dias. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to welcome you to the, to the conference. Um, I'm really delighted that the Chicano Studies Institute could help uh, co-sponsor um, this event. I'm also um, very pleased that um, the university was able to, um, to organize this event, event in conjunction with La Casa de la Raza, which is 
really the um, premier uh, community-based organization in Santa Barbara uh, servicing uh, Latino communities and uh, I think probably 10,000 plus go through their doors um, every week and um, there, are, there are many on campus who want to have those collaborations with La Casa. Um, I, I'm very grateful for the fact that we've been able to work with um, Raquel Lopez who's the, the director there to make this happen. Um, it's hard to find, find a form of expression better uh, equipped to convey the richness of Chicano and Mexicano culture than, uh, than a corrido. Um, and I think this helps explain why Américo Paredes, the, um, one of the founding figures in Chicano studies, launched the field with a um, very careful uh, study of the corridos. When half of Mexico was ceded to the United States um, through the war, uh, that was promulgated in the name of Manifest Destiny. The Corrido helped fill the gap that was left when Spanish language institutions and newspapers uh, were dismantled. Uh, um, a crucial role. So as long as there's been a Chicano, uh, Mexicano underclass in the United States, um, the Corrido has played um, a crucial role in terms of uh, sustaining the community. Uh, the Corrido has been a, a crucial repository where Chicanos and Mexicanos could uh, tell their stories about their communities. These, these stories are remarkably varied and they offer uh, a window into more fields of knowledge uh, than I can name. But it does therefore represent an invaluable form of artistic expression uh, that convey unique facets of the politics, history, and sociology of the Southwest. As such, they represent an invaluable teaching and research resource, one made to order for a California K through 12 curriculum desperate to speak to the diverse students um, uh, in compelling and um, effective ways. A landmark in its own right, this conference also signals a host of, of opportunities that will be developed for many years to come, uh, I am sure, and it is uh, really wonderful to be part of this event. Um, I want to uh, conclude by, by thanking you all the participants who've come from, from uh, sometimes short distances, sometimes great distances to be here. Um, I also very much want to thank the Arhuli Foundation um, and Chris for um, the very generous grant that made this event um, possible. It's been very good to, to work with Arhuli. And um, again, I want to signal thanks to um, Teresa Pena, the business officer at the Chicano Studies Institute, who has shouldered um, a great deal of, of the work that's made this um, possible. That's been a labor of love for her. And, um, and we owe great um, thanks to, to her uh, for her efforts. Finally, I want to thank Maria Herrera Sobek, who um, wears so many hats, um, it's, it would just be impossible to, to produce the list. Um, she is, of course, the Leal Endowed, um, Luis, Luis Leal Endowed Chair, an internationally acclaimed scholar of the Corrido, and she has been working very hard to make this uh, event a, a success in addition to her full-time administrative duties and teaching duties in the Department of Chicano and Chicano Studies. So thank you to, um, to all of you, and I look forward to a great conference. Thank you, Carl. And uh, I also had scheduled uh, uh, Chris uh, Starkwist to see if he would be so kind as to say a few words uh, since he was our main sponsor for this event. Well, I guess, I don't know. Uh, it all started a good while ago. Uh, I started a foundation because I remember the late Mo Ash of Folkways Records once told me, Chris, you know, we got to think of what we're going to do with all our stuff when we go on to the next big dance over there, you know? <laughs> and so I started the Arhuli Foundation with the uh, hope that somehow the most unique part of my huge record collection, which is a collection of roughly 17,078s and 23,045s, all of Mexican-American music, and that that somehow be preserved because in all these years of collecting records and knowing tons of record collectors, nobody ever seemed to collect Mexican records. That seems to be a totally, they say, oh, well, that's weird stuff. Anyway, I became fascinated as soon as I came to this country back in 1947. I heard Mexican music on the radio and thought this was the neatest accordion music I ever heard because uh, it sounded so unlike any European accordion music I ever heard. And so, although I still don't speak any Spanish, which is really a disgusting thing, but I have to admit it. 
And the last time I took some lessons from a lady, she said, Chris, what you're doing is really dangerous. <laughs> because your pronunciation is pretty good, but then you open your mouth and try to say things, and there's a bunch of gibberish. And people think you're totally bonkers. So I just won't even try anymore. But uh, I did learn how to tell people that I wanted to make recordings of them, and I knew those words for grabado, <laughs> un disco, <laughs> so on and so forth. And um, anyway, as we started the foundation, I had met uh, Professor Guillermo Hernandez way back in the 70s when he was a student at UC Berkeley. And Les Blanc and I worked on a film that eventually was called Chulas Fronteras. And uh, we advertised, I think, or let the Chicano department know at, at UC Berkeley that we wanted some students to come and help us edit. You know, you got to look at footage, you got to decide what's going to be good, what should be part of it, and how to sequence it. We didn't have a script for that film or anything. We just, I dove into this. I told Les, listen, I want to document this music. It is the most unbelievably rich uh, culture in this country, and nobody has ever done anything with it. And uh, so uh, Guillermo Hernandez, who was a student, and he came to us, and uh, he not only helped us in the editing process, but he was apparently fascinated by these 78s that I had. And I'll never forget, there was one in particular. <laughs> Usually I wouldn't pick up records if they were totally beat up, you know, because I thought, oh my God, you know, I can't even listen to it. But there was one on Vocalion, I'll never forget it, and he found it in all that stack. I don't know how he found it. I later asked him, he said, I asked him, Guillermo, why did you pick that damn record that is so worn out? I couldn't even hear anything on it. He said, Chris, that's the reason I picked it. Obviously, those people who bought that record really liked it. They just wore it plumb out. I was never able to find another copy of it. It was the Corrido de Ramon Delgado part one and two, and it's apparently about the conflict, not like Gregorio Cortez, but not unlike it, between German Texans and Mexican Americans in, in South Texas. And uh, anyway, that started the whole t <laughs> insanity, whatever you want to call it. But Guillermo really went through these records and more and more, and he published a wonderful little booklet called uh, uh, does anybody remember the title of it? Uh, the Chicano Cancionero, Chicano Cancionero, or something like that. Anyway, when we started the foundation, I said, you've got to have Guillermo on our board of directors. And so he uh, was happy to, to, to join us. And he first wanted to get the, co the collection for UCLA as it was. I said, no. <laughs> This is, these are my little babies and I want to listen to them and I feel like it. And I know if it just goes into an archive, they'll just be stashed away in some musty cellar and nobody will ever listen to it, nothing will ever be done. And so um, it happened during that uh, wonderful uh, event at UCLA, the Corrido Conference, I think. He asked me, Chris, um, I know you brought some of the musicians, I mean the foundation helped bring some of the musicians to the Austin conference from Monterrey, Nuevo León, uh, El Palomo y El Gorion, and uh, oh, who was Julian Garza. And, oh, there was a whole bunch of them, yeah. And so he asked me, well, who do you think I can get to here in the LA area? And I said, listen, you're in California, why not try for Los Tigres del Norte? They're the biggest thing going, you know. And they got along really fabulously. And the Tigres came, played at Royce Hall. I think they were impressed that actually an institution like UCLA was interested in their songs, in their music, as the literature of the people. And so they started a foundation of their own, the Tigres del Norte Fund, at UCLA was given $500,000. You see a lot more of all this in our film that we're going to show as part of our presentation that I had Maureen Gosling and Antonio Cuellar put together uh, just about two weeks ago. They did it really fast from amateur footage uh, shot. Anyway, I better make it a little bit shorter here, <laughs> otherwise this goes on forever. But I thought I'd give you a little bit of a, of, of, of a background how uh, Guillermo really became a major uh, part in my whole thinking about what to do with it. And so he succeeded in having them, the Tigris, give this large fund to UCLA. And it was dedicated to preserve 
this collection, the 78s, the 17,078s, on digital. And the UCLA Music Library was willing to take it on, and they are making it available now to scholars. You can hear the entire selections if you go to UCLA. You can hear 60 seconds of it, I believe, isn't it, Tom? Something like that. If you dial up the Frontera collection on the internet, you can dial up arhuli.com, or you can dial up, I think, the UCLA. Anyway, I'll, I'll have you meet Tom in just a minute. Uh, and so this really is what made it all possible. Los Tigres del Norte gave the money, and so we were lucky to find people. Actually, this Antonio Cuella, he's been with us now for five years, I think. He has listened to every single one of these records. Yet, he is a, he's a wonderful guy. He is a punk musician. He has a Mexican punk band. They've traveled in Europe and Mexico, but he is totally fascinated by this richness of the Mexican tradition. Uh, I hope some university will hire him one of these days. I mean, he's a, he's a real jewel. Anyhow, so that's, uh, I want you to meet Tom Diamond. Uh, Tom, do you want to come up and maybe add a few words to what I neglected to say? Or uh, he is the manager of not only Arhuli Records, but also of, at, he's the, what, what are you, the secretary general or something of the Arhuli Foundation <laughs> or treasurer? Something. I forgot. Actually, I'll just say hello. My name is Tom Diamant, and I'm, I'm uh, the project director of the Digitizing of the Frontera Collection, and we're going to do a presentation on that tomorrow, so I'll, I'll save, save my comments for that. But uh, if it wasn't for Guillermo, uh, it, it, we would have never embarked on this digitizing process, which we originally started as a preservation uh, concept because we're in El Cerrito between two earthquake faults and these fragile 78s were sitting on the shelf. But as soon as we started doing it, we realized that access was really what we were involved with here, getting it so that people could listen, people could find out about it, the richness of this uh, wonderful collection of music. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay, thanks, Tom. Thank I'll just in, in conclusion with... Um, and so it seems to have been that, this, uh, that Guillermo started this wonderful tradition of having these uh, congressos del, del Corrido, but uh, Jaime tried to get it going in Austin. That would have been the ideal place, I hate to say it, but I know Santa Barbara is a lovely town. But you're closer to, the, <laughs> to where that stuff all comes from, in a way. Uh, but they just never got it together, and so wonderful what happened here was Maria Herrera Sobek volunteered out of the blue and I said, come on, Tom, we, we still have some money there. We got to help out on this. And so I hope that, uh, that it'll be a rewarding thing and maybe it'll help keep this whole thing going. All right, let's hope some more conferences in the future in different places. Thank you very much. We'll see you later. Thank you, Chris. And our next uh, speakers are Dan and Mark Guerrero, Lalo Guerrero's uh, sons, who will say a few words. Hola, good morning. I'm Dan, my brother Mark. Okay. Um, we'll make it very short because it's going to be a long and wonderful day. First of all, we do, of course, want to thank Maria for working like a dog. This is not easy to put these things on. And poor Teresa, where's Teresa? Oh, she's checked into the Betty Ford Center. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work, so thank you so much, and to the university for, for hosting such a wonderful event. And getting to see old friends, Christine Chavez, hi, Mija, and, and Jim Griffith, who lives in Tucson. Every time I go, we never see each other. I run into him here. What's that about? And Chris and Tom, who are national treasures, and even if you don't speak Spanish in your heart, I know you speak it perfectly, so don't worry about it. They've been good friends for a long time, we've never met, so we do thank you very much. Um, we're going to do our presentation a little bit, so we'll save all our words uh, for that, but I do want to say that some of you may or may not know, where's Sal? Sal Um Our dad's collection uh, is up here. Uh, it's been, I don't know, how many years? Seven, eight? 
eight years, uh, all of Dad's um, scrapbooks from the 30s and 40s and photographs and programs and videotapes of performances, everything is here in the Lalo Guerrero collection. So this is kind of our second home. Uh, they also have my collection, and they're about to get my brother's. So you're up to your ass in Guerrero things here at the university. <laughs> so um, thank you for this opportunity and for this wonderful, wonderful conference. And uh, we're going to talk a little while more, but do you want to say something no, now? Nothing to add to that. You know, so Mark's going to sing you. later, so, so that, that'll be the real treat. Thank you so much. Sean Noriega was supposed to be here representing UCLA and uh, representing also uh, saying a few words about uh, uh, Professor uh, Guillermo Hernandez, but he was unable to make it because he has a meeting with a chancellor and when the chancellor calls, you go. <laughs> so, but he will be here tomorrow for the panel. And so our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Raquel Lopez from the Casa de la Raza. Buenos dias. Good morning to everybody. It's such a pleasure and a delight to be here this morning as a non-academic. <laughs> and I just wanted to take this opportunity to invite everybody to La Casa this, um, this evening. We're so excited to have been um, invited to participate with Maria and, and Chris, who came to La Casa that afternoon and came by and stopped by. He had met um, Maria and, and Carl at the university and came in and said he was from the Arhuli Foundation. I was so excited. I order music from the Arhuli Foundation. So I couldn't believe that Chris was in the building and talked about the conference. And it was such the, the right time. You know how when two things connect at the right time? I had just discovered that album that you had, that's been passed around. I had just discovered it probably months before that, one of the um, former executive directors of La Casa had sent me a CD copy of it because the version that we had was warped, didn't work, couldn't play it. And so I got a copy of it and I started listening to the music that was created back when Manuel was involved with Don Luis and Armando, the whole crew from back in the 80s. And um, the music was so inspiring that I talked to our youth center director and I said, Francisco, why don't we start an after, in our after school program, get some of the local talent like uh, Juan Zaragoza, Luis Moreno, and Jorge Mijangos, folks who've been promoting music for, for years in town, and start an after school corrido program at La Casa. And we did. And so when Chris walked in, I said, I can't believe you're here. We just started our after school program. Um, at La Casa for a youth around corrido music. And so when Maria invited me to participate, I was more than excited and, and, and just so pleased to be doing this. And so this evening, what we're going to be having is a corrido contest. We have 14 corridistas who have signed up locally, who have written original music and will perform this evening. And they're going to be um, judged by some of the folks here today. And then on Saturday is our Festival de la Raza down at the beach where the three finalists will perform in front of thousands of people and will be chosen the one winner um, on Saturday. So it's, it's such a nice way to connect the community with the academic world um, and remind ourselves that the stories that I heard that day in my office um, from, that was created with Manuel and Armando and Don Luis and the music we'll hear tonight is still relevant because it's the lives of our families, the people who work and labor and contribute to this country. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be involved and I want to thank everybody. So please make sure to come out tonight and tomorrow at La Casa. Thank you. And thank you, Raquel, for having us there. We were really, really excited about having this community and uh, ac ac the academy also, or the, us uh, academics over here uh, participating and, and uh, making connections and making friends. And so we're, re we're really f looking forward to going to the Casa de la Raza for food. And of course, everybody here will, is invited to, it's a community event, and uh, we'll be having food, music, and uh, good times and the Corrido Contest. Uh, in, in your program is uh, the detail and also the address, so if you look at the program, it will tell you the time and events. Uh, 
because uh, Chan, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Cho Noriega is uh, not here. I thought that maybe Salvador, Salvador Huereña, you, you might want to say a few things about what we're doing also this afternoon and also uh, tell us a little bit about the, the exhibit that you have on Latino music. Well, we've been uh, very honored to have a number of uh, key collections in the California Ethnic and Multicultural Archives that document the history of Mexican-American Latino music. And it was over t overdue uh, time to have an exhibition uh, where I felt that it was important not only to call attention to these legendary greats in the music, but also to listen to the music and provide an opportunity for people to listen in and hear all the different selections that are represented in the exhibition. So Guide by Cell uh, allowed us to be able to uh, have people use their cell phones and you can call in the morning for a mambo, you can call uh, for a bolero with your breakfast burrito, <laughs> Uh, if you're feeling like having a little uh, a boogie swing in the evening, you know, you could just call it in and listen to it or set your telephone at home on a uh, speakerphone and turn it into an instant radio and listen to the selections uh, that are in the show. So we're very pleased to do this. We're in the special collections in the library on the third floor. Looking forward to seeing you there for our reception and uh, come in and especially come in and take a look at the uh, exhibition. And um, uh, Lalo is featured prominently. Prominently, Don Toasty, Adelina Garcia, there's uh, um, Malo, there's uh, Richie Valens, there's, there's a whole slew of different, uh, uh, you know, important musical uh, geniuses that are part of our Latino heritage, so uh, please come and join us. Testing, testing, testing. Testing, testing. Hey, with all the all the stuff that you know, yeah. This is part of the Corridos de Aztlán. Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. El día 9 de mayo, oiga bien lo que decimos, fue ganado el rancho Cespe para la unión de campesinos. Es que vino César Chávez. A invitarnos a su unión para acabar con malos tratos y también la explotación. Nos decía el dueño del rancho: Vénganse, mis muchachitos, no ven quesos de la unión, no más son. Puros malditos Y nosotros nos reímos De verlo tan compugido Pues le apretaba la soga Que él mismo había tenido Andaban muy apurados Mandando cartas de amor Y también unos comprados nos decían, no quiero unión. Nos mandaron sus agentes para dar explicaciones. Cuando oyeron, ¡Viva Chávez! Y se hicieron en sus calzones. que ya les ganamos con honor las votaciones votaremos por contratos que nos dan más protecciones compañeros campesinos que votaron por la unión la virgen 
de Guadalupe les dará su bendición. Ahora sí, mis compañeros, ya les cante mi canción. Ahora griten, ¡Viva Chávez! Y también, ¡Viva la Unión! It's a great such a great honor to have the family of Lalo Guerrero. I was six years old in Juarez, Mexico. And we used to have events about school. And the best music that we can think of was Lalo Guerrero, Las Ardillitas, and Pancho, Pancho López, Chiquito Pero Matón. That's the song that I remember, six years old. Then when I met him in person at La Casa de la Raza, and I was able to shake his hands, Music came back to me again. So I am here because of Lalo Guerrero. And to see his genes still doing it, my God, it's a great honor. You know, Pancho, Pancho Lopez, Chiquito Pero Matón. Hey, okay. We're waiting for other people to get back. Okay, thank you, Francisco. It is my pleasure and my honor to present to you our keynote speaker, John McDowell. John is a long, long time friend of mine. We go back, back uh, decades. <laughs> with the American Folklore Society when we were both very, very young. And of course, uh, since we were very uh, much interested in the corrido, we became good friends. Uh, I admire his work and use his uh, articles uh, constantly. I constantly quote him in my uh, personal uh, research and my personal writings. Uh, John McDowell, is uh, currently a professor of uh, folklore and ethnomusicology in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, at the University of Indiana. And uh, he received his PhD at the University of Texas at Austin. He studied with the famous Américo Paredes. And he's not only an ethnomusicologist, but also a linguist. And I, he speaks many Native American languages, including Quechua. Is that uh, what I read in your, in your website? Uh, he has written many, many books, including Sayings of the Ancestors, the Spiritual Life of the Sibundoy Indians, and So Wise Were Our Elders, Mythic Narratives of the Kamasa. In addition, he has uh, one of his latest, uh, most recent books is Poetry and Violence, the Bella Tradition of Mexico's Costa Chica. He did anthropological or ethnographic work in the Costa Chica, which uh, Professor Francisco and I have been very lucky to have visited because it's a very interesting region that has uh, a huge uh, Afro-Mestizo, Afro-Mexican population, which in addition is very rich in the corrido tradition, aside from other folk uh, song uh, traditions. So we were lucky that we were able to go to the Costa Chica, Francisco and I, and experience some of these fabulous uh, musical traditions of the Costa Chica, where Professor McDowell did his ethnographic work. From this ethnographic work came Poetry and Violence, the ballad tradition of Mexico's Costa Chica, of uh, which I I said uh, in a review, uh, John McDowell's book, Poetry and Violence, is a brilliant, in-depth analysis of the relationship between the violence and the corrido. McDowell's splendid insights into an Afro-Mestizo Mexican community and its cultural production are invaluable to those interested in the corrido tradition. 
the interviews undertaken in the Costa Chica, the corrido collected, the corridos collected, and the photographs included in the books in the book are particularly outstanding. From this ethnographic work that he did, uh, there is a website uh, that uh, uh, John can ho hopefully tell us. And I reviewed uh, the collection of this ethnographic work that's uh, in the website, and it is just fabulous. I highly recommend it. And so now. Uh, not wishing to take any more time from John, I present to you Professor John McDowell. Thank you, John. Thank you very much, Maria. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, I couldn't choose better company, uh, a group of people who love the corrido as I love it, so uh, I feel very honored. Um, in addition to the two uh, very important people that are being honored by this uh, conference. I'd like to also mention two people that we lost uh, this year in 2008. One of them is my uh, colleague and friend Merle Simmons. Some of you may know this name. Uh, you may have seen his book on uh, the Corrido as a source for the interpretive study of modern Mexico or something. I always get the words confused, but it's, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, on that order. Uh, Merle passed away in January of this year. And also I'd like to uh, uh, remember Miguel Arismendi Dorantes, uh, musician, composer, and folklorist uh, uh, from the state of Guerrero, from Ejido Nuevo, as he would very proudly say, in the state of Guerrero. This has been a lot of fun so far. Now it's going to get kind of boring, so I apologize for that, but I think that's my role. So here we go. <laughs> the Corrido of Greater Mexico, uh, a genre of heroic poetry set uh, to the melodious tones of Mexican music, has always throughout its remarkable trajectory been closely associated with politics, broadly construed as the struggle for influence among competing individuals and social groups. Hence, it is not strange to pose the question, what kind of political animal is the corrido? Or put differently, is there a consistent political tendency perceptible through the genre's many twists and turns across time and space and upon the tides of history? There are so many strands to the remarkable corrido tapestry that it might seem foolhardy to speak of a consistent political tendency or any other constancy running throughout the fabric. Corridos have been produced and consumed in a range of environments, answering to a formidable range of concerns. Antonio Avitia Hernandez, whose five-volume compendium is the most exhaustive collection we possess, identifies a dozen regional varieties and traces their progress chronologically from the insurgency beginning in 1810 to the mid-1980s, which is not to say the corrido tradition ended in the mid-1980s, but that was the cutoff point for his 1997 uh, publication. Much as Merle Simmons had done before, Avitio Hernandez explores the intimate connection be between corrido production and the currents of history as they have impacted Mexicans in their motherland and across the northern border. In view of this genre's expansive trajectory, is it even possible to isolate a core or to speak of a characteristic tendency? In what follows, I will argue that the most persis persistent political stance of the genre is contained in a discourse about mal gobierno the abusive authorities who hound the good citizen into a life outside the law and eventually pursue him unto his death. I will relate this persistent thematic to the social labor of the genre, which typically involves elaborating a chronicle of local and regional history that will enter into the canon of collective memory. This commemorative work entails assimilating actual events to the heroic template a locus where all parties to conflict can find some sustenance. I confess at the outset that my perspective is shaped like anyone else's by the circumstances of my exposure to the genre. In the interests of full disclosure, I state that my understanding of the corrido originates in the instruction I received from my mentor in corrido studies, Américo Paredes, and comes to maturity in the research I have conducted over the years on Mexico's Costa Chica, site of what Avitia Hernández terms the uh, corrido afro-mestizo. In essence, my perspective is grounded in what I will call the corrido of finite community. On the Texas-Mexican border, as in the coastal settlements of Guerrero and Oaxaca, the corrido has thrived as a permeable text, that is, a narrative of local scope that is open to local perceptions and experience. 
someone approaching the genre from another angle, say from the vantage point of commoditization or of a committed political ideology, might well parse the genre's history differently. Certainly, Paredes attributed to the corridos of the border a hefty political role, that of redressing verbally the physical wrongs perpetrated by Anglo invaders against the Mexicano rancheros and townsfolk of South Texas. Border corridos like Gregorio Cortez, Jacinto Trevino, and so many others offered a voice to the defeated in a vein of cultural production that has been called the vision of the vanquished. The oppressors could be ridiculed for their big feet, patones, and for their consumption of ham and cheese sandwiches, a very <laughs> unusual diet. They could be compared with demeaning intent to women and children. The historical narrative could be set straight. The racist claims of historians like Walter Prescott Webb could be corrected. And as Paredes showed with respect to Jose Mosqueda, history itself could be politicized through the process of folklorization, the imposition of a dominant pattern of thought on an amorphous set of events, as when a story about a train robbery was transformed into another tale of ethnic conflict. My contention is that the corrido gen generically tends to be an indirect political instrument, not readily charged with political ideology, not easily allied with political factions. And here I'm not talking about the corrido de Osama, uh, 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 de Obama, de Obama, this is going to be a problem. They <laughs> I'm not talking about the corrido, let me start over with that sentence. I'm not talking about the corrido of uh, uh, Barack Obama, which many of you have, have probably experienced, and Maria sent it around um, on YouTube. But, um, but, um, but I'm talking about the popular corrido, which is the corrido that circulates through oral tradition. I, really, nowadays you have to say through a, a, a mixture of media, but among them hopefully um, including uh, oral dissemination, face-to-face -face communication, that kind of thing. My thinking here will frustrate the political activist who wants the corrido to be targeted, uh, to be a targeted tool of the downtrodden. Equally, it will worry the aesthetician who prefers to think that art is above the fray of politics. But I believe this formulation, painting the honorable citizen as one who is reluctantly propelled into rebellion by an abuse of authority, best captures the inherent political disposition of the genre. And indeed, the corridos of ethnic conflict, so admirably charted by Americo Paredes, can be assimilated to this mold with the border folk playing the role of honorable citizen and the Anglo establishment and especially their stormtroopers, the Texas Rangers, playing the part of abusive authority. Let me uh, bring up uh, an, an episode from my fieldwork on the Costa Chica that I think is instructive here. I was struck in my work on the Costa Chica that composers formulate the corridista's mission in terms of a commemorative function. For example, Onofre Contreras, Acapulco composer and musician, aspires to write songs that will give comfort to both sides in a quarrel. He explains his practice this way. Para eso hay que, ten hay que tener un poquito de táctica, un poquito de esta manera, de cómo ir haciéndolo, ser cuidadoso. Ya hice este verso y no estoy agrediendo, estoy hablando de aquella familia y no lo estoy agrediendo. Ahora, ok. Hago un verso donde menciono estos. También no estoy agrediendo, no estoy diciendo nada mal. A lo contrario, si le puede poner un tantito de buena alimentación, perfecto. English? Anybody? Let me do it. Uh, English? For, what, for, for that, you have to use a bit of strategy, a bit of, well, style, as uh, to how you go about doing things. You have to be careful. Now I did this verse, and I'm not insulting them. I'm speaking about that family, and I'm not insulting them. Now, okay, I do a verse where I mention those people. And again, I'm not insulting them. I'm not saying anything bad. On the contrary, if you can add in a bit of good nourishment, that's perfect. Another composer of the coast who everyone calls El Cobarde uh, told me in a similar vein that he hopes to write corridos that even relatives of a fallen hero will be able to get up and dance to. So in these conversations, the corridistas uh, tended to see themselves as keepers of the peace rather than as agitators for a cause. I take this ethos as articulated and practiced by Costa Chican composers as representative of a kind of a core thematic in the genre. And it accords well with uh, what folklorists have always said about ballads, which is that the ballad has an objective stance 
Uh, that can be pushed too far, and we'll, 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 we'll look at some of the problems with that. But it does, it does tie into that discourse about uh, the ballad historically in other parts of the world, which is said to typically adopt a, a somewhat objective uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the events that it narrates. But this doesn't mean that corridos are not political. Indeed, I see corrido discourse as deeply political, but in a register that is implicit and indirect. Political ideology is largely alien to the genre. And remember, again, I'm talking about the popular ballad. There obviously are, I have a whole uh, um, cassette of corridos about uh, Luis uh, Echeverria, which, was, which I picked up back when he was running for president. Yes, I go back that far. Um, uh, and, and that was in the previous century. But, um, but, uh, but those corridos are, are not, the, they're not the popular ballad. They haven't entered into, uh, uh, into the oral tradition. And so I'm setting all of that kind of thing aside. It gets more interesting when you look at corridos about Lazo Cardenas. Some of those corridos really have entered into uh, oral tradition. But um, in the time that Maria has given me, we, we don't have uh, room for um, untangling some of those uh, finer details. What we find in the corrido, I would argue, uh, in this core uh, part of it that I'm looking at, is something that is more powerful than, let's say, a passing uh, political ideology. Um, I think what we have here is um, uh, a politicized worldview. So really, I want to I talk a little bit about this idea of a politicized worldview. It is mal gobierno, the badly managed political state, that sets in motion the catastrophic events in many, many corri corrido plots, or at the very least provides their preconditions and extends their drastic results. This mal gobierno rhetoric assimilates the many perpetrators of violence in the corrido storehouse to the model of the re revolutionary and blurs the distinction between good, violence, and bad. And that's a, a, a theme I want to return to at the very end. Now, um, let me make a little bit of a transition here. So I do want to talk about mal gobierno, and I am putting it forward as a core thematic here. But I want to complicate that notion as well. And, uh, and, and that's because there's so many things happening in the corrido um, that I don't want to restrict our focus to, uh, to this one possibility. Um, I do see a watershed between what I will call politics writ small that is the sort of rough and tumble of local um, disputes, and politics writ large, where we see competing political factions at the regional and national level entering the picture. So there's a, there's a kind of a watershed there. Um, there are an awful lot of corridos on the Costa Chica, and I believe probably in all pockets of uh, corrido production, where, um, there, there, for example, there are songs about two best friends who get drunk and shoot at each other. OK, right. Um, in a sense, they seem seems kind of apolitical. Nonetheless, often in those situations, if you look behind the scene, you'll find out that those individuals actually uh, were part of a political structure, and it's not entirely random that um, that they happen to to quarrel. Uh, there, there, there are a lot of songs on the Costa Chica that are about uh, feuds between uh, rival, um, I, I would say, gangs, brosas, or um, gr groups of um, of, of armed men, and um, uh, it, th th those, uh, most of those corridos don't really articulate a larger connection. They really talk about a feud where the logic of it is, the logic of the corrido is always about revenge. Somebody has been killed on one side, somebody else must be killed on the other side. Um, some of those corridos sort of cross over from the politics small to the politics big in that um, uh, there's a great example of Juan Colon, which is a very popular corrido uh, around the area of Cruz Grande on the Costa Chica. And it starts out, Juan Colon goes off to visit a neighboring village. Um, he's on a kind of a, a party. He's having a good time. Um, of course, he gets killed. And so that's pretty much in the uh, mold of the, of the, the, the corrido uh, where a, a feud is being um, presented to us. But then the, the, the last several stanzas of that, uh, stanzas of that, corrida, of that corrido talk about um, how contacts in Acapulco and Chilpancingo, which is the state capital of Guerrero, and all the way up to Mexico City are enlisted to sort of um, contain the, uh, the uh, fallout from, from that event. So there are some of these sort of very locally oriented corridos that do actually give us a glimpse of the larger apparatus uh, that's involved here. So my, my categories are somewhat uh, loose and by the way, I don't feel that I've totally figured this out, but, um, 
But nonetheless, I think we can, we, we can that make, make that kind of distinction between the more locally oriented corridos and then those that really do implicate larger kinds of issues. And I, I want to concentrate a little bit now uh, on the sort of politics writ large. Okay, these are the corridos where we're going to um, uh, see maybe something that um, uh, will be recognizably political in terms of regional and national issues. What I'd like to do now is uh, actually walk through uh, just a handful of, um, of corridos from the coast. If we had um, a couple of hours, I could, uh, I could really do some more with this. But, uh, but just quickly now, let me, let, me, let me bring in some of the corridos. Um, if I'd had a chance to work with uh, Manuel and some of the uh, other uh, musicals here, we could, we could put on a little show. Well, Maria, how, how, t how tight are we on time? It's your call. I'm, we're pretty tight, I have a feeling. No, I, 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 I think to be safe, we probably better. It's very tempting, but uh, what I can do is I can sort of hum the tune for you. And like, uh, the first one I want to talk about is Chante Luna, El Corrido de Chante Luna. And um, this, is, um, this is an interesting case. Uh, let me just give you a little background on it. Uh, Celestino Luna was uh, much of a presence in Acapulco and on the coast of Guerrero, both the, both the Costa Grande and the Costa Chica, uh, during the uh, Alejandro Gomez Maganda term of, of governor uh, there in, in Guerrero. Uh, a glance at the newspapers of the period reveals much concern with pistolerismo, hired guns mixed up in politics, and Chanti was among the more visible and ruthless of these tough characters. The corrido alludes to the death of a man named Barajas as the pretext for Chante's suppression, and the newspaper account in El Excesor from August 25, 1952 substantiates this linkage. In the newspaper, though, it's set up as Los asesinos de Dr. Dr. Barajas preparaban una matanza, una matanza de policías. So the big headline says, the, the uh, murderers of Dr. Barajas were planning a massacre of the police. But the Corrido poet, in contrast, stresses the human side of Chante, appreciated as a true friend and a beloved son. In the Corrido, we encounter a hero betrayed by an iniquitous government who rises in the cause of self-defense. In the midst of agreement over the essential facts, the newspaper account and the Corrido account are very, very different. And there's a third storyline. I was talking to um, somebody on the way over in the van, um, which is the sort of talk on the street. And the talk on the street about Chante Luna is that uh, the, the government at the time was mixed up in uh, drug stuff. They were sending marijuana, ma marijuana and cocaine up, up to the states. And uh, Chante was sort of helping. He was involved in it. They decided Chante knew too much, so they figured they had to get rid of him. Okay? So it's a, a, a third storyline, and it makes um, El Corrido de Chante Luna possibly the first narco corrido. Although it's a hard claim to make because it's not brought um, into the, the surface discourse of the ballad at all. Um, but the interesting thing about the corrido is that it sets it up. The very first stanza says, uh, it goes, Voy a cantar un corrido a los que me están oyendo. Diré lo que pasó en el estado de Guerrero. Mataron al Chante Luna por órdenes del gobierno. And so it's this kind of thing. It sets up the government, the, 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 the mal gobierno, as um, um, the, 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 um, the, the culprit in the story. Um, so that's a case where we have um, a, um, uh, a corrido that um, definitely um, uh, invokes the mal gobierno uh, paradigm. And there's so many of those, so many of those. Think about all the corridos, Valentin de la Sierra, right? Por su mala suerte cayó Valentin en manos del gobierno. Um, and we can all go all the way back to Prisco Sanchez, uh, down in, Mor in, in Mor uh, Morelos in Puebla and Heraclio Bernal up in the, uh, in the north. And throughout the tra trajectory of the corrido, we have the mal gobierno theme. So I'm going to set that aside for a moment and talk about a couple of subtypes here. L let's look at politically charged corridos. And um, very quickly, I want to talk to you about Juan Escudero. I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with his name, Juan Escudero. It, this is a name that should be better known. Juan Ranulfo Escudero Reguera, who was known as Juan R. Escudero, was a remarkable figure who rose to prominence in the ebb and flow of the populist movements following the initial phase of the Mexican Revolution. Scion of a leading Spanish family allied with the Gachupin uh, oligarchy in Acapulco, he became their scourge as leader of a populist movement uniting workers and campesinos on the Guerrero coast in the early 1920s. 
After attending college in the United States and spending some time in San Francisco, nearby San Francisco, San Francisco, Frisco, uh, where he may have met Ricardo Flores Magón, an important theorist of the revolution, Juan Escudero returned to Acapulco and be began organizing the workers who loaded and unloaded ships calling at the port. He began publishing a lively and polemical magazine called Regeneración after a similar enterprise started by the Flores, Ma Flores Magón brothers in exile in the United States. Escudero founded the Partido Obrero de Acapulco, the Workers' Party of Acapulco, and was elected Presidente Municipal, Mayor of Acapulco, in 1921, a position that he held for two successive years. In this capacity, he initiated a set of reforms aimed at improving the lot of the common man and introducing authentic common man and woman, excuse me, and introducing authentic forms of political representation. An assassination attempt in March of 1922 left him partially paralyzed but still active. In December of 1923, he was eliminated by his enemies among the local establishment. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, the corrido of Juan Escudero is that um, it, uh, it begins to present a kind of a political angle on, on events. Um, basically, just uh, to, to, to move through it very quickly, um, the, um, the, the, the problem of class conflict is, uh, is on the surface of the corrido. It's, it's not something that is implicit. Also, there are hints of imperialism because in two stanzas, uh, one stanza mentions foreigners who are um, allied with the wealthy Gachupin families, and another stanza actually talks about the gringos who were uh, vigilaban los caminos y vigilaban las playas. So the gringos, which we don't quite know who they are, the gringos were watching the roads and, and, and watching the beaches. Um, as uh, this, this sort of counter reaction came in and swept through um, much, of, much of Guerrero. So, uh, uh, so here we have a politically charged corrido. I have other examples. I, if I had more time, I'd talk about Genaro Vasquez, a very interesting case, uh, and Lucio Cabañas. These were two figures uh, who were quite important when I first went down to Guerrero, and uh, corridos were written about them, and the corridos tended to be politically charged. So the um, the, I was interested to find out when I went back to Guerrero in 1996, uh, the corrido about Lucio Cabañas uh, is still in oral tradition. So that was, that was uh, now, now part of what these corridos do, like the one about Lucio Cabañas is interesting. Let me just give you a couple of lines from it. Um, in order for a corrido to really uh, sustain a presence in oral tradition, um, this is my whole argument, isn't it? It can't, it can't just be a kind of a diatribe. It can't be um, a, a political uh, sermon, political sermon, uh, um, you know what I mean, um, a polemical sort of political um, uh, statement. But it has to really uh, do what corridos do, which is they tell stories. They tell stories in engaging ways. And, um, and it has to, I, I believe, uh, assimilate the hero to this, to some extent, to this mal gobierno prototype. And... Um, and we see that in Lucio Cabañas. Uh, for example, this is an interesting example of it. Les grita Lucio Cabañas, voy a darles la batalla. Yo no le temo al gobierno, también traigo buenas armas. Yo represento a Genaro, he de morir en la raya. Okay, it says, the gov oh, no, that's not. Lucio Cabañas shouts to them, I am going to give you a fight. I do not fear the government. I also have good weapons. I represent Genaro. I'll die standing my ground. But I... Two, two points about that stanza. One, it goes into that mode of this um, setting up the scene where you have two people, uh, you have this um, reported speech, you have this dramatic moment where people are addressing uh, uh, words to each other. And is, isn't that really at the heart of what the corrido does? I mean, it sets up these, these, these really very dramat dramatized, highly dramatized uh, scenes. And Amerigo Paredes wrote about that. He talked about how the corrido moves from one sort of uh, um, vignette uh, of this kind to, to, to another. Not only that, the, the, the last line there, he de morir en la raya. Does anybody know what la raya is? Does anyone know what the... Uh, what? It's a line in the sand. Um, the way it's always interpreted to me in the Costa Chica is it's, it's, a, it's a reference to the cockfight. Because when you have a cockfight, the two sides, they draw a line in the sand where the, where the, where the gallos are going to uh, be released. 
And it's such, a, it's such a productive metaphor in the popular corrido. And to find it here in a corrido about Lucio Cabañas, I think, shows a, a very interesting mixture of the, the sort of popular idiom, but also at the same time, um, a corrido that has a, has a very clear um, political orientation. I could also talk about El Corrido de Aguas Blancas, uh, which was, there was a, some of you may remember the massacre that happened in 1995 in Aguas Blancas. Um, some uh, campesinos were coming down to Acapulco for a uh, political demonstration. The bus was stopped. They were pulled off the bus and 17 uh, men were killed um, by the, uh, the state judiciales. And this, this thing just blew up. It, it became very problematic. Um, finally, uh, the governor had to step down. It was assumed the governor was, the, as they say, the, uh, the intellectual author, uh, the, um, the person who, 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 uh, who called the uh, shots on that one. Um, and so there, there are just quite a, quite a number of examples where you have this, uh, what, I th what I think of as this sort of politically charged discourse that works in a corrido to some extent, but still, I think, uh, within a kind of a framework of, of the mal gobierno. Um, so uh, I, I, I want to just take up a couple of other um, corridos that further complicate the model in interesting ways um, before I, I have just a, a few concluding remarks. Will that work out? Good. Okay. Um, let me talk about El Corrido de Aliria Carmona. And uh, this is one that's very, very popular among men in, uh, in, in Guerrero. Uh, let me see if I can bring it to mind. Pongan cuidado, señores, lo que les sale. Esa Liria Carmona quedó en la calle. Esa Liria Carmona quedó en la calle. By the way, corridos in minor keys. Uh, if you want to hear a corrido in minor key, go to the Costa Chica. I don't know, I'm not aware that you find them anywhere else in the corrido world. This is a very interesting corrido. Um, take heed, gentlemen, of what comes about. Aleria Carmona landed on the street, ended up on the street. The one who took her off, he was in the right. Tell me, Aleria Carmona, who did the deed to you? You know, quien te hizo el hecho, no? The one, uh, the one who took her off was Ismael Marin, so he could marry her by civil law. Then, oye Ismael Marin, no seas tan vil, te casarás conmigo por lo civil. So don't, don't be mean, get, marry me, let's get married. Um, then we, we find a little more about Aliria Carmona. En esa casa verde fue mi desgracia, me encerraron a fuerza en esa casa. Inside that greenhouse was my misfortune, they kept me there by force, inside that house. Uh, le mando a amenazar Tirso Carmero, que le manda el corte si no el dinero. He sent, over, he sent over a threat with Tirso Carmero that she should send the dress or else the money. That Tirso Carmero, he's full of it. Está pendejo. Ese Tirso Carmero está pendejo. Yo no le debo corte ningún dinero. This is Alirio Carmona speaking. Uh, he's full of it. I don't owe him a dress or any money. Then, ponga cuidado mamá lo que me pasa. Esta Alirio Carmona ya no es muchacha. That's uh, Ismael Marin talking. Uh, just take a look, mother, what's happening to me that this Aleria Carmona is no longer a virgin, no longer a girl. Um, the corrido goes on, it comes down to uh, the final line, the final stanza is interesting. Me voy, a des me voy a despedir, no me disgusto, esa Aleria Carmona quedó en el gusto. So, I will take my leave, I'm not angry, Aleria Car Carmona uh, s remained in the high life, in el gusto, in the high life. This is a reminder that the corrido is open to other kinds of political discussions. Uh, here we have, uh, in Aliria Carmona, we have a discussion of gender relationships, traditional gender relationships on the Costa Chica. Uh, Gonzalo Aguirre Beltran writes about this quite a bit in his book Cuitla, where he talks about um, bride capture, okay, which was very traditional and I believe still happens to some extent um, on the Costa Chica. Um, and uh, the, the whole sort of ritual of if, if the woman is discovered not to be a virgin, how she, she can be taken back, uh, deposited um, in, in, in the center of town, but it creates a lot of problems between the families, and there are quite a few corridos about that situation. However, this is the only corrido I have, and I think it's very special, uh, which really gives voice, in a sense, to the woman, uh, the woman's uh, situation here. And I, I, this corrido can be interpreted a lot of different ways, and I, I recognize that I'm on um, thin ice here. Um, but but I'll, I'll just say this. I think that um, what's, what's striking to me here is that 
Um, Illyria Carmona, who is obviously a victim, she's a victim of sexual abuse as a, as a, as a young, as a child, and, um, and then she sec she's victimized again when she tries to enter into proper society, into normal society, and she's rejected because of that earlier uh, uh, experience, and yet her voice comes out very strong, and she comes out as a real presence in this corrido, and then I don't know what to make of that last line, quedo en el gusto, is that a good thing or a bad thing, and, and you know, I'm not going to pronounce on it, but I think it's very interesting that there, to me, this is a corrido that I heard a, a lot at bohemios and places where men get together to, to exchange songs, um, and yet it's, uh, it, it presents a kind of a, a, a strong, a portrait of a strong woman who has somehow persisted through all of this adversity. Let me finish with uh, in my examples with one last one, El Corrido de Mariano y Sus Vaqueros. This is a, a corrido that just, it, 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 it amazed me when I found this one. Um, this is a corrido that comes out of the gay subculture of the Costa Chica. And who knew there was a gay subculture? I guess there's a gay subculture anywhere, right? I mean, um, uh, but, but sure enough, uh, here in an area where, where, where one thinks of machismo and so forth, and yet the corrido is somewhat macho in its own way. Um, but it talks about a, a, a figure known as uh, Mariano, and his vaqueros are kind of the, the, the young men that he had around him. And um, it's, it's very interesting. Um, you, you really get some insight into, into sort of the gay culture in, uh, on, the, on the Costa Chica. So we find out savanear. So savanear would seem to mean going out and bringing in the cattle. Um, but what it means here is going out and bringing in the young boys, or I should say the young men. Let's be, yeah, let's say bringing in the young men. And um, um, it's, it's very interesting here the... Um, the um, the men in this corrido call each other comadre, they call each other compañera, okay? Um, so there, there's some insights here into a subculture that I think, nor, in, unless, you, unless you really had access to it, you, you might not even know it exists. Uh, so, so my point with both Aliria Carmona and with Mariano y sus vaqueros is that, um, as I say, we have to be on the alert for the, the, uh, the openness of, of the genre and how other kinds of political issues, issues that have to do with so, social issues and, uh, and lifestyle issues and other kinds of, of political questions can come into corrido discourse. Okay, so I'm running through things. I want to get to the conclusion now and just uh, try to um, not really wrap things up because like I said, I don't think I have this figured out yet um, and that's probably readily apparent, but, um, but at least to, um, to pull together a few thoughts here at the end. The corrido of Mexico's Costa Chica and also the Costa Grande, offers a fertile field for assessing the political tendencies of the genre, though admittedly there are many other corrido zones equally deserving of close attention. Still, our sampling of coastal corridos makes it possible to design a taxonomy of the corrido's political content, beginning with the distinction between those local venues that I, talked, that I mentioned but didn't really talk about very much, and the more global kinds of venues where uh, regional and uh, national politics and social issues uh, that concern the wider community uh, come into play. Subtypes within each group point to different levels of articulated political discourse and to the different societal arenas implicated in this discourse. Recognizing the multitude of possibilities here, it is still plausible, to my mind at least, to locate at the core of the genre the powerful theme of mal gobierno. As noted, this theme is implicitly political as it encodes a politicized worldview, but it does not readily mesh with more explicit political rhetoric geared to the politics of the moment. If the job of the corrido is to tell a story in a commemorative vein, potential sources of social fragmentation must be avoided or handed, handled with delicacy. One curious consequence of the inclusive strategy entailed in the mal gobierno paradigm is that all corrido protagonists tend to assimilate to the heroic ideal of the bold man or woman standing up to the mismanaged government, whether their actual lives and deeds merit this recognition or not. This folklorization of actual facts, and I'm actually, I'm quoting from a, uh, a title that uh, Paredes gave to one of his articles, Folklorization of Actual Facts, which is the imposing of a dominant conceptual model on diffuse events, tends to make heroes out of bandits, rustlers, re rebels, revolutionaries, all of them. In this paradigm, figures as diverse in their actions and motives as Vicente Guerrero, because I have another corrido that's written about Vicente Guerrero, by Miguel Arismendi Dorantes, um, uh, 
assimilating Vicente Guerrero to the model of the guerrillero. So, in a sense, Genaro Vasquez and Vicente Guerrero, it's all the same story. Very interesting sort of continuity, historical continuity that is proposed here in this Corrido Discourse. We can bring uh, Juan Escudero, Chanteluna, Genaro Vasquez, as I say, and Lucio Cabañas all into this same paradigm of, the, um, of mal gobierno. By the way, when I asked people about this, because I was puzzled, uh, some of these guys, like Chanteluna, was basically a cold-blooded killer. And why is he in this, in this gang, in this collection? And people would say, no, no, they're not the same, because some of them were fighting for an ideal. So, Outside of the corrido, people make distinctions, but I don't think the corrido readily makes those kinds of distinctions. On the coast of Guerrero, the favorite flavor for politically charged corridos is leftist tinged, with issues of class conflict and imperialism lying at or very near the surface of the discourse. There is an inverse relationship among these variables, though. The more politicized the discourse of the corrido, the less suited it is to sustained popular consumption. All of these examples we have looked at, all the ones that I brought up here, exhibit immersion in the stylistic conventions of the popular ballad, the use of vernacular language, the creation of dramatic exchanges of words among story protagonists, the presence of key images such as those drawn from the cockfight. The, politi the politically charged corrido, it seems, must strike a balance between telling a good tale in a familiar lingo and proselytizing for the cause. Too much of the latter and it becomes ephemeral, an occasional song detached from the mainstream of the tradition. Importantly, corridos like Aliria, Carmona, and Mariano y sus vaqueros remind us that the corrido can also serve as a vehicle for airing and inspecting political issues, issues nestled in a more personal arena. Corrido discourse often strives toward consensus, folding the personalities of a town, of a region, or indeed several regions, into a national ethos of heroic resistance. But we see in corridos addressing social issues such as gender relations and gender identity that the genre remains open to voices and agendas at the margins of society as long as these can be expressed in terms congruent with the, with the heroic vernacular. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will be all together for lunch, so if you have any questions, uh, we can continue the, the discussion there since uh, we are uh, pressed for time now. So uh, thank you. Thank you, John. It was an excellent presentation. Uh, we'll now have the first tribute to Guillermo Hernandez, and this is by one of his uh, former students, uh, Juan Carlos Ramirez Pimienta. Juan Carlos? Buenos dias. Good morning. I feel very, very honored to have been invited to this working celebration. I met Professor Hernandez in 1992 when I was a graduate student in the Spanish and Portuguese department in UCLA, where he was, of course, a professor for many years. I had been there for almost a year, but I had not met him because he had been directing the UC program in Mexico City. I rem remember my fellow grad students telling me, you're going to like him. He is a corrido professor. I also remember thinking, is there such a thing? <laughs> Pretty soon, I was taking his corrido class and getting ready to deliver my first academic paper. It was at the corrido conference in Monterrey, Mexico in 1992. Some of you were there. Needless to say that meeting uh, Guillermo Hernandez changed my academic as well as my personal life. However, I believe that the best way to honor Guillermo Hernandez is to disseminate his work. Más que utilizar estos minutos para hablar de la generosidad que como colega, profesor y mentor siempre caracterizó a Guillermo Hernandez, quisiera hablar de un esfuerzo tangible de homenaje que me encomendó la revista Aztlán, producida por el Centro de Estudios Chicanos de UCLA, UCLA, centro que por tantos años dirigió nuestro homenajeado. Se trata de un dossier que será publicado próximamente y que consta de tres textos de Guillermo. Lo que leeré a continuación será incorporado a la presentación del dossier. 
Como investigador y teórico del corrido, Guillermo Hernández, lo mismo discurrió sobre el género en su totalidad que sobre un aspecto que pudiese parecer secundario de algún corrido en particular. En Hernández encontramos la combinación del incansable viajero que hace investigación de campo, pero también aquel que no desdeña lo que las nuevas tecnologías proveen, ni mucho menos la reflexión de escritorio. Guillermo dedicó incontables horas a pensar el corrido, así como a escucharlo y buscarlo. Lo que he hecho con los textos que publicaremos en Aztlán es corregir algunos errores tipográficos y asegurarme de reconstruir el sentido cuando estaba seguro de este. Como ya he mencionado, el dossier consiste de tres textos. El primero, que es el más extenso y profundo, es el ensayo que iba a fungir como introducción al estudio que sobre el corrido Hernández preparaba desde hacía tiempo, varios años, ¿no? como algunos de ustedes saben. El libro llevaría por título, al menos el último título, de agravios, calamidades y venganzas, una historia del corrido. La introducción, por su parte, se iba a titular El estudio del corrido en los albores del siglo XXI. Más adelante hablaré de este texto. Las dos piezas restantes son un breve estudio del corridista Víctor Cordero y otro de Rosita Alvírez, el famoso corrido norestense. En el texto sobre Víctor Cordero, autor paradigmático y fundamental en la diseminación del género en el siglo XX, Hernández trata la genealogía de un fenómeno muy actual y presente de manera preponderante en los corridos hoy en boga, la proliferación del antihéroe como protagonista. Hernández arguye al referirse a dos de, los, de las más famosas composiciones de Cordero, el corrido Juan Charrasqueado y Gabino Barrera, que los antivalores con que su autor los dota no pertenecen a la tradición corridística, que el ser borracho, parrandero, mujeriego e irresponsable con la familia son características negativas en la sociedad rural donde emerge el corrido. Este desfase, enunciado desde las ciudades, principalmente la capital mexicana, es, de acuerdo a Hernández, mediatizado por otras producciones culturales, como son la canción ranchera y la cinematografía de la época, sobre todo la comedia ranchera. ¿no? Por su parte, el texto sobre Rosita Alvírez trata precisamente ese enigma corridístico, conocer las circunstancias de la creación de este corrido, uno de los más conocidos del folclore norteño. Su labor investigativa, que en otros casos, como en el del corrido contrabando del, del paso, llevó a Hernández a proponer de manera muy convincente y documentada su protagonista, su autor y contexto, resultó en buena medida infructuosa en el caso de Rosita Alvírez. A pesar de haber hecho una intensa investigación de campo en Coahuila, donde según el corrido se llevan a cabo los hechos, Hernández no pudo dar con ninguna pista ni de autor, ni de actores o circunstancias históricas del corrido. Lo que hace entonces Hernández es una interesante y aguda lectura cultural del corrido de Alvírez y de la resemantización que, hace, que de él hace Lalo González el Piporro. Y ya había escrito él en algunas otras partes un poquito sobre esto. ¿no? En relación al texto que, servirá, que serviría como introducción a su libro, consideré incluso dejar en su lengua original, en inglés, un par de notas. Eh, en lugar de traducirlas, me parecía que dejarlas tal cual apuntaba a otra de las grandes cualidades de la labor de Guillermo, su extrema comodidad con dos de las principales fuentes del estudio del corrido, la hecha en México y la hecha desde Estados Unidos. En efecto, Guillermo Hernández entendió como pocos los códigos culturales mexicanos en ambos lados del río Grande Bravo y supo reconocer el problema de estas dos líneas de investigación que se han mantenido por muchos años corriendo de manera paralela, pero muchas veces sin atender la una a la otra y otras de plano parecen ir en direcciones opuestas. Guillermo sirvió como uno de los principales puentes para establecer y restablecer esta comunicación. Un esfuerzo en esa dirección fue el número especial de la revista Slan, que algunos recordarán, de 1997, dedicado al corrido. En aquellos años yo trabajaba como asistente de Hernández en ese proyecto y recuerdo claramente lo importante que era para él que hubiera representación tanto de estudiosos del corrido basados en México como de los que trabajaban desde Estados Unidos, estos últimos en su gran mayoría afiliados a universidades, 
No era ese el caso de los colegas de México, muchos de los cuales eran y son investigadores independientes. Guillermo consideraba extremadamente importante que esas voces se unieran por el bien del corrido. Como parte de esta misma labor de acercamiento, es que Guillermo también ayudó a forjar una, una generación de corridólogos que han continuado aportando al campo, como son los casos de, entre otros, Guillermo Berrones y Armando Ortiz. Y esto eh, dejó escuela a él, sobre todo en, en Monterrey y también en, en Michoacán. ¿no? Aclaro que no sé siquiera si la versión de la introducción que publicaremos es la última que había escrito. Sí es, eso sí, la que me pareció más completa y reciente de lo que pude encontrar en sus archivos. De entrada, el texto manifiesta una de las constantes preocupaciones de Guillermo, la dificultad de hacer un estudio histórico del corrido a causa del desdén, ninguneo, diría él, que ha sufrido el género. En más de una ocasión, al charlar, al charlar comentábamos sobre las dificultades de impartir cátedra del corrido a nivel universitario. La principal no era, como pudiera pensarse, algún impedimento curricular o falta de entusiasmo de administradores, sino la falta de capital simbólico percibido por los estudiantes potenciales, sobre todo y lamentablemente por aquellos de origen mexicano. Yo no vine a la universidad para estudiar al piporro o a los tigres del norte. A continuación, quiero leer algunas cuartillas de este texto de la introducción al libro de Agravios, Calamidades y Venganzas, Una Historia del Corrido, Introducción, El Estudio del Corrido en los Albores del Siglo XXI, Guillermo E. Hernández, Universidad de California, en Los Ángeles, y paso a su voz ahora, ¿no? Esta no es la historia del corrido que se debería escribir a principios del siglo XXI. Si estas fueran otras circunstancias, hoy dispondríamos de una vasta documentación en torno a este importante género a partir del siglo XIX o quizás aún desde antes. Nuestro repertorio de corridos llegaría a decenas, quizás cientos de miles de letras recogidas a través de los años en, por compositores e intérpretes, investigadores, familiares o aficionados. Estos textos estarían en archivos o guardados celosamente por coleccionistas, además de haberse publicado en hojas sueltas, revistas, cancioneros vamos, y libros. Dispondríamos también de la música del corrido, anotada por escrito a lo largo del siglo XIX, pero con intérpretes en grabaciones fonográficas recolectadas en vivo desde principios del siglo XX. Quizás hoy estos materiales estarían transfiriendo a una inmensa base de datos digital para su preservación, estudio y diseminación. En estas circunstancias imaginadas, también contaríamos con amplia información en torno a los compositores e intérpretes del corrido de diversas regiones, tanto profesionales como aficionados. Sabríamos quiénes hicieron, iniciaron el género, los más prolíficos y aquellos de mayor popularidad. Asimismo, tendríamos testimonio de sus historias personales, sus repertorios y la inclinación poética o musical que los llevó a convertirse en autores de corridos. Conoceríamos sus técnicas de composición, si primero imaginaban los acordes musicales y después los textos, o bien procedían a la inversa. Tendríamos relatos de los contextos que inspiraron las letras y la música, y las opiniones y reacciones de sus primeros públicos, así como cuándo, por quiénes y cómo se difundieron sus corridos. En este mundo ideal, habría documentación de los personajes mencionados en los corridos, sus historias personales y los hechos que los llevaron a actuar como lo hicieron, tanto su representación en los corridos como en la vida cotidiana. Diversos aspectos de la vida de estos personajes estarían a nuestra disposición en la documentación histórica de archivos regionales y nacionales, donde habría copias de actas de nacimiento y de función, tanto parroquiales como civiles, así como en los expedientes de los procedimientos jurídicos de archivos judiciales y en vastas colecciones hemerográficas y fotográficas. Contaríamos con un legado generacional de investiga investigaciones y estudios que permitirían una perspectiva en torno a la cultura popular de las diversas regiones donde el corrido se ha venido cantando desde hace casi ya dos siglos. Las recopilaciones de los textos y la música de corridos serían parte valiosa de nuestro conocimiento de la historia regional, tanto en la organización social, la lengua utilizada, las costumbres, los valores que rigen y han regido la conducta de sus habitantes, además de, las, de su psicología y otras características económicas, sociales y artísticas. 
A su vez, este conocimiento nos permitiría tener una mejor comprensión del corrido como un género que plasma momentos fundamentales en la historia regional. Sin embargo, las condiciones para escribir tal historia del corrido no existen en la actualidad. Nuestra realidad es distinta. Las colecciones, archivos y publicaciones regionales, cuando existen, frecuentemente son de difícil acceso y, las más de las veces, carecen de organización y de índices. Los empleados de los archivos generalmente laboran heroicamente, con escaso apoyo institucional y sin preparación profesional, recursos, equipo y recintos que les permitan una apropiada conservación de los materiales y el fácil acceso a la documentación a su cargo. Como resultado de esta grave situación, el investigador del corrido generalmente se enfrenta a condiciones inhóspitas y ha de seguir sus pesquisas con verdadero empeño, aunque una ciega obstinación siempre es preferible, para lograr rescatar algunos datos del olvido. Los hallazgos son raros y las búsquedas infructuosas son la regla más que la norma. Sin embargo, llega a suceder que se localice algún individuo, familia o documento que, sorpresivamente, permita el descubrimiento de una rica mina de información. A base de estos logros se han venido armando una serie de líneas de investigación del corrido que nos permiten vislumbrar la trayectoria de este valioso y versátil género popular que lo mismo atañe a las ciencias sociales que a las humanidades o a las artes. Por algún tiempo los escasos especialistas del corrido han manejado una serie de preguntas fundamentales que siguen vigentes y que no deben soslayarse en el estudio del corrido. ¿Cuándo? ¿Dónde? ¿Y cómo surge el género? ¿Desciende acaso del romance español? ¿Procede de la epopeya prehispánica? ¿O es una creación mestiza que se desarrolla en alguna región en particular? ¿Qué género o géneros le anteceden o le sirven de contexto? ¿Qué relación tiene con otros géneros como la décima, la balona, la canción narrativa o la canción lírica? ¿Cuáles son sus rasgos más distintivos? ¿Cuál es su definición más apropiada? ¿Quiénes han sido sus autores? ¿Cuándo, en dónde y por quién fueron creados los corridos más importantes en la historia del género? ¿Cuáles son estos corridos importantes y por qué lo son? La lista de interrogantes es interminable y propicia abrir nuevas áreas de reflexión, debate e investigación. Todas estas preguntas están interrelacionadas de tal forma que, por ejemplo, si carecemos de una definición de corrido, no podremos establecer un corpus representativo de diversas regiones, épocas y temas, lo cual a su vez nos impedirá distinguir las características básicas del género y en tal caso careceremos del suficiente conocimiento necesario para trazar la posible evolución del corrido, sus etapas más distintivas e importantes, sus rasgos fundamentales, así como su relevancia histórica y su valor artístico. Los, lo cual nos lleva a la paradoja de no poder definir las características fundamentales del género y cómo podríamos reconocer un corrido al escucharlo. Es decir, se trata del dilema de la serpiente que se muerde la cola. Sin embargo, a pesar de lo formidable e inescapable de tal empresa, la situación no es para evadirla, pues como ocurre en todo campo de la cultura, lo importante no estriba en las respuestas que se puedan derivar de tal pesquisa, sino que, al cuestionar e intentar responder a preguntas fundamentales, se llega invariablemente al planteamiento de nuevas fuentes de estudio e investigación, que a su vez permiten una mayor comprensión del fenómeno, que en este caso representa el testimonio cultural de un pueblo que por varias generaciones se ha dado la tarea de crear y apreciar esa valiosa tradición artística que denominamos el corrido. Muchas gracias, dobles.